We shoot in real prisons. Wait, so you guys go in the federal buildings or Real no? prisons. There's inmates just walking around. Like, so lunch that day, so lunch is always like six hours after call. Before we shot our scene, they broke for lunch. So I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go, go to lunch. Lunch was in prison. Lunch was in the commissary in, in a real prison. So I go on the elevator and there's, I'm with a PA, uh, which is a production assistant. And there is also two inmates with a guard in the elevator. And the guys were like, oh shit, it's Tariq's roommate from Power. I'm like, dude, this is insane. I am so excited for today's episode. I had the opportunity to fly out to Los Angeles a couple weeks ago and interview actor Gianni Paolo at Spotify's State of the Art podcast studio. In this episode, we get into how Gianni got into acting, his rise and success on the star's hit TV series, Power and Ghost, and what it's like to film inside a prison and play the role of a criminal. Huge shout out to Spotify for sharing their studio with me, and I'm very much looking forward to doing more with them in the future. My plan is to head out to LA once a month to shoot some exciting interviews with a wide range of guests, and I'm so excited to share it with you guys. Now, without further ado, sit back, relax, and get ready to lock in with Gianni Paolo. You know what's interesting is that there's this world of individuals like yourself who are actors who like play criminals in the show right, right. and or just have no affiliation to being in jail and they're interested in the content because right. they've never, you know, experienced that. Right, right. So it's cool that like the world like allows individuals like us to connect because in a yeah. different lifetime, we probably never, never would have yeah, connected. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I did do some musical theater back in my day though. Oh, no, wait, wait, where'd you, you went to high school in Connecticut? <laughs> yeah, Danbury High School. Nice. I was in Montessori school for up until like seventh grade. Nice. And then I went to public high school and I actually owned a club. Um, it was called Tuxedo Junction. Right. And um, I, we did like, the chain smokers, nice. Steve Aoki, like all these raves, and that's nice. how I ended up going, getting into trouble and right. going to prison. Wait, so what was it like? I I've listened to a lot of your videos, but like mm -hmm. refresh it. You just did some fraud stuff with some money that came in, or so what happened was in a nutshell is that um, I started off all legit. Mm -hmm. I was doing these teen parties, mm -hmm. selling ten fifteen dollars a ticket, all cash. I was killing it, like ten fifteen thousand uh, dollars a night once a month nice. on these teen raves. Right, and then I wanted to get into the big concerts. In order to get into big concerts, you have to have money to produce the shows. Right. First show I did was Big Sean, uh, my freshman year of high school. That's crazy. It tanked. We lost like 40 or 50 racks, oh. and that was our own money. Right. After that, we started raising money, and what happened was I was over-promising and under-delivering. Like, right. I was so confident in that we were doing uh, Chief Keef Tyga. Chief Keef stood me up, didn't show up the night of a show. What? Wild stories, man. Damn. Um, so... I just over-promised, under-delivered, and right. then I was like a kid. So when people were like, well, where's our money, this and that, I just kept lying and lying to right. try to like cover it up and to stall so I can – because I always wanted to pay everyone back. Right. And uh, I just got way in over my head, and then I started borrowing money from shady people, right. and it was just like – it turned into an accidental Ponzi scheme is right. what I call it. Like picture Damn. like Billy McFarlane mixed with like – Wolf of Wall Street, and then running the club right. as this teenager and stuff. Wait, like, so how many years did you do? I did three years. Uh, I got a three-year sentence. I did 24 months. Oh, fuck. Hey. But it was the best thing that could have ever happened to yeah, me. Yeah, for sure. And uh, HBO actually did a documentary about my story. Oh, nice. Um, but then when they merged with Discover, they took it down uh, uh, because it was a part of a bigger series. Right. But we have like a pitch deck and we're hoping, you know, one day it'll turn into something we're working on a book and stuff. Right. Maybe um, I'll play you in a TV show. That would be pretty – you could you could fit the part. I think I could. If we did it in the next couple of years, I could. Yeah, you need some tattoos though. <laughs> so we got to get you some tattoos. But, Are you tatted? Yeah, I got full sleeves. Uh, yeah. I wish I could. See, that's why I don't have tats because if I had to play you, like <laughs> I would have to cover and then put new tattoos on. I have leg tattoos but like – Oh, I didn't know you had leg tattoos. Yeah, everything oh. here, like whatever you can see – with the shirt and pants on, yeah. I have no tattoos. Oh, and you because. have something right here, right? I saw. On, yeah, yeah, right here. What here. was that shirtless thing you were doing with Theo Vaughn? Or was it? I, I was watching something on YouTube. You were doing. You were sitting on someone's lap, and you were. Oh, like, Chris, this, Chris De Stefano. Oh, okay, that's you know what Chris. It was. I, I've never met him. But, yeah, he yeah. he um he's a comedian. I don't know, like because I come from that world, like. Before I did Power, uh, I was producing comedy podcasts. I was booking guests. I was doing social media for Theo Vaughn, Chris De Stefano. Andrew Santino, like Bobby, like all like the big comedians. So I come from that world. So 
Chris, I did his podcast like maybe a year and a half ago. You know, Power had already come out. And uh, I just will do dumb, goofy shit where it's like sometimes people are like, wait, well, why are you doing that? I'm like, I come from this world of comedy podcasting. <laughs> like, that's like my root. So I don't I have no problem like taking my shirt off or being dumb or being stupid like that. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people want you to be like the cool, like good looking guy that you like you see on television. I'm like, nah, I'm just I just want to have fun. So I come from that. So that's what you probably saw that video. And I think we took like <laughs> mushrooms and then did like a, another episode. I don't remember it was so long ago, but yeah, I think that's what you're talking about. And it's interesting meeting someone that plays someone in a show. You fit Braden's character right. so perfectly. Well, the reason that happened is because I um my character was originally in power written like my brother, Trace. Mm-hmm. He was like a, kind of a stuck up douchebag. He was Tariq's roommate. But me, the way that I was, I knew what the lines were and I did to, you know, serve the scene. I knew what I was there. It was supposed to be some uh, conflict with Tariq in, in original power. But then I came in one of the takes and they're like, have fun with it. And I kind of was just really me and just having fun and making jokes and improvising because I, you know, did a lot of live stage improv. So I knew how to like, you know, put a joke here, put a button here. And they loved it. And uh, I think that's, you know, it made Michael laugh. Michael, not to like, he was laughing. Mm -hmm. So it made them see a different side of Tariq where like, oh, wait, he actually is like a human being and like not always just angry and trying to sell drugs. Like it shows another part of him. And I think that's why they kept me around because they're like, oh, he, Brayden brought out this in Tariq. And then they just started writing towards of who I was for the character, which is fucking crazy and, you know, making jokes here and there. And that's why you see a lot of that stuff now in book two. It's a lot of just who I am. And it's a lot of my own jokes that I put in there at the end or, you know, I talk with the writers. And that's why it's very similar to who I am <laughs> as Brayden. Yeah, I mean, you guys are both just incredible actors. And I feel like as an audience member, we underappreciate it in the original power because you guys didn't get to necessarily grow into the roles you're at now so right. it's so cool to see the growth yeah from that yeah. just like it's awesome but let's get into it man it's it's a pleasure to have you on the show uh we've been talking about this uh for a few months and yeah. uh you're so responsive like i appreciate that of man. course of course um, yeah dude i saw your videos <laughs> like yeah i think it was sometime last year and Dude, I think, did you post like a 10 minute clip on, on I've TikTok? I've been doing TikToks 10 minutes now. Yeah. Dude, you posted like a 10 minute clip and I remember <laughs> watching it and being, and 10 minutes had gone by and I was like, holy shit, I watched this whole shit. So, uh, I, I loved your story. I mean, it was a while ago now, maybe about like, you know, eight, nine months since I, you know, watched that clip where you were telling your specific story. I've obviously seen your clip since of other people you've had on, but I was just so fucking intrigued. So I, I followed you and you're, you know, you're a great talker. You're a great podcaster. So, um, yeah, we just kept in touch and here, here I am. Yeah. And we're actually, we grew up kind of close. You were in Rhode Island. Yeah. I used to do shows at URI. Oh, really? I did. uh, What year did you graduate? 2013 high school, so I'm a year older, I think. Yeah, You're yeah. 27 I'm, now? I'm, yeah, I, I, mm-hmm. I was uh, graduated in 2014. Did it, Where did you go to college? I didn't go to college. Okay. I moved to L.A. and. But you had a hockey career. Yeah. And the reason why I want to bring that up is because are you f- familiar with the Danbury Trasher story? I am. So yeah. I do AJ's podcast, Talking Trash. Oh, no way. He's a good—we got to get you a jersey. Yeah. Do you want one of those? I would love one. Okay, we'll get you one. I actually, so funny, uh, they're doing a movie about him, mm-hmm. and I read for AJ's part. We are nothing alike, and, it, it, you know, I knew I wasn't going to get it, but I remember when when it came in, and I was like, oh, shit, like, I love this. this Dude, um incredible. Because it happened during the pandemic, like, when that came out. And like my next door, my parents' next door neighbor is one of the brothers, um, what's, what's, uh, uh, Omicelli, the Omicelli brothers who they were like talking back and forth in the documentary. They were like the two funny brothers and the trashers one. He, they were my next door, na- my parents' next door neighbor during the pandemic. Wow. So like when it came out, it was like this whole, like, oh my God, no way. Like they played hockey in Danbury. It was like this whole thing. And then my brother got in contact with AJ and they sent my brother a Jersey. So my brother has a Jersey and I don't. Oh dude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, say less. We yeah. got you. Yeah, cool. AJ comes to the studio all the time and his dad was recently on AJ's podcast oh, for nice. his like first one right. and when his netflix deals expires he's gonna come on to ours nice. to kind of like tell his story yeah and i know they're doing the series at netflix nice like, it's uh, a whole series yeah or? that's what i thought they were doing a film but. so that the movie with uh is on peacock or uh-huh. something or apple or mm-hmm. something that you probably read for yeah. with that famous actor that's producing yeah, it that's uh, playing the david dad. harbour right yeah, yeah that's playing the yeah. dad and then um they're doing a series at netflix damn um so they're working on that but drake just blew the whole thing yeah up. it was crazy <laughs> when he posted the jer- it's such a cool jersey 
too. Like it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I gotta get you. I'll get you a hoodie too. The hoodies are fire. The fire. Yeah. That'd be so, dope. so what was uh, school? Like, what was like uh, high school like for you growing up um, in Rhode Island? High school was actually like I had a great time in high school. So I played junior hockey for my junior and senior year. So bear with me. I went to my same high school for four years. But junior year, I went to a different high school for three quarters and then transferred back. And then my senior year, I went to a different high school for two quarters and then transferred back because I was playing the hockey season. And then I would just come back to my regular high school because I didn't like I would play in, you know, Pennsylvania or, you know, uh, uh, Maine. Mm-hmm. And like none of my friends are there and no one who is on my because uh, I was playing junior hockey. Pretty much everyone was out of high school. So it was just me alone in this random town just going to this local high school and the second the hockey season was over i would just transfer back to my old high school um but i had the fucking like people always say like you know high school I, dude i had the best four years <laughs> like i had such a good time how would your friends describe you from back then if we had them here today i mean exactly the way that i am now just like crazy will fucking say anything i i did i got in a lot of trouble in middle school but I knew in high school that if I wanted to, because I wanted to play, my, the goal was play Division One college hockey at an Ivy League school and then do the theater program. So, like, I was like, I wanted to go to Yale or Princeton because they have good theater programs. And then I could do acting and I could play D1 college hockey. It, you know, it, it'd be the, you know, the best of both worlds. Uh, so when I, you know, I was playing junior hockey for so many years and I was like, Dude, if I – they want you to be a 21-year-old freshman at these at these colleges because they want you to, you know, be big and strong. So you, when you graduate, you don't go right to college. You take a couple of years off, do nothing, and then you just play hockey. So I'm like, by the time I play four years of college hockey and all this stuff, I'm going to be 24 moving to L.A. Like I'm going to miss all my high school roles. By the time I was 24, I was already on power. I'm like, I definitely made the right choice. Um, sometimes I think, you know, I wish I played college hockey, but like, I, I think I made the right choice on, I, I moved out on my 19th birthday. So I played one year of junior hockey and, um, that during that one year is when I really dove into acting in Rhode Island. I did a play. Um, I was doing a lot of, uh, live improv it, all in Rhode Island. So I was having such a terrible year playing hockey and I was having such an unreal year acting and doing that stuff and I was like this is what I want to do like I don't I don't want to play college hockey anymore was it a hard decision at the time I know now looking back on it it's easy to say but back then I, weirdly it wasn't like I so there was this there was this it's so funny because my dad saw him the other day his name's Scott Harlow and he was one of the biggest pricks <laughs> I've ever met in my life and I'll say that fucking anywhere um he was my junior hockey coach and he really fucked me over my last <laughs> two years of, of playing and I'm so thankful that he did because I, I really think like I, I'd, I'd be playing college hockey, maybe not starting, maybe just being like fucking miserable and I would have never moved here. So what he did actually really was of service to me and like, dude, I'm fucking living my dream right now. So it, it really wasn't a hard decision because I had such a fucking shitty year that last year playing that I was like, I'm so done with hockey. Like I'm just done. And I moved out here. I lied to my parents a little bit. I was like, I'm going to come back um, and I'll, you know, I'm just going to go there for the summer and then I'll come back and we'll, and we'll, uh, you know, I'll play one more year junior hockey. I never touched my hockey bag again. I put it in the closet. I brought it with me, put it in the closet and yeah, I just started auditioning and that was that. No, it could be fake, but I was reading some articles that you were close to getting to the next level in hockey. Yeah. I mean, I was drafted in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, which is like, um, you know, the league at Sidney Crosby play. It's like one of the, it's the best junior league you can play in before you go um, to the NHL. So, I, you know, I had a lot of D1 colleges that were looking at me. You know, Princeton was like the one that I wanted to go to and their whole coaching staff got fired. It was like this whole thing. And that's really like, that was my goal. Princeton and and do theater there. Um, but that's why like my grades weren't great in middle school because I was so fucking crazy. And then... In high school, I kind of got it together with the grades, but, like, I still was pretty fucking wild. I think living on my own with my older brother helped me a little bit um, because he was on my junior hockey team my junior year in Pennsylvania. It helped me grow up a little bit, but I still was fucking just (laughs) out of control. But my my freshman and sophomore year, like, I I can't even believe, like, I didn't, like, go to fucking jail. Like, I was—we were just doing crazy shit just all the time. Yeah, when you watch content like like mine, for example, of the people that— 
you know, have gone to prison or even someone like me, we're so similar in age. Do you ever compare that to you and be like, wow, that could have been me if I did one wrong move? For sure. Like I remember my seventh and eighth grade, I was, I was, dude, I was selling weed. I was definitely getting in with like the wrong crowd. I got cut from a team, the Long Island Gulls when I was 12, I played on a team on Long Island and I lived in Rhode Island. So I would just drive to Long Island on the weekends. It was like three and a half hour drive. And the reason I got cut is because I couldn't practice with them because I was living at home and I, I was 13. I didn't want to live away from home. So I got cut. And I remember that was the year where I'm like, fuck, like whatever, fuck hockey. And I didn't really have a team to play for. So that was the year I kind of got into some shit. And yeah, dude, you could, you know, we, we would get in fights, whatever. You could easily hit, punch someone and their head hit the ground and you're, you know, manslaughter. You're in jail for 10 years. And so I've had people like that on the show. It's crazy. Yeah, it really is. Were your parents supportive overall of whichever you chose, hockey, acting, moving to L.A.? I My dad wanted the hockey for me. He didn't want the fucking acting at all. Um, my mom was like, chase your dream. Like, do whatever the fuck you want. Um, now, since my dad has been on a red carpet with 50 Cent, he's like, all right, you made the right <laughs> choice. But, like, yeah, my dad wanted hockey for me. And, you know, obviously he wanted me to get an education. And he they put so much into me playing hockey. Um that that's obviously, you know, what they wanted, which I understood. But at the same time, I'm like, ah, just I knew what I wanted to do, dude. Ever since I was really young, I was like 13. And I had every hockey coach, like I would say wild shit in the locker room because I had older brothers and all of his friends would be over. And they would like snap their heads and be like, what did you just say? And I would make them laugh. And they were like, you should be you should be do entertainment or stand up or acting like you shouldn't play hockey. And I always thought they were trying to like compete. Like their kids were on my team and they're like, let's get this good kid out of here. <laughs> that was like my brain back then. Um, but that was the first time I ever entered my head. Like, Oh, like, yeah, I could, I could maybe do this. And obviously watching Disney channel, like, Oh, how cool are these kids? You know? Yeah. You never were like a Disney star or anything like no, that. It, luckily, because I've met all those kids <laughs> and they're fucking out of control. Like, at least I grew up with some like normality and uh, you know, my friends, I, I feel like Michael is such a good, who plays Tariq. He's such a good testament of child actors. Every child actor I know is f like fucked. <laughs> and but Michael, he grew up around his normal friends in Staten Island while he was on power. So he is still like, you know, a child actor and, you know, he has the fame aspect of it. But he since he was around his old, you know, his friends growing up, he's so normal, which is like I'm able to see how Michael operates and I'm able to see how a lot of these kids operate out in L.A. And I'm like, oh, these kids are really fucked in the head. Like, yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Who do you look up to as a child or as a teenager in the acting world? Who do you want to become? Like when I was really young, I remember I was like 10, 11. I would I loved Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. I was oh, like, great oh, show. Dude, I was like, <laughs> these guys are fucking legends, you know, and I really like that. So Raven, I thought, um. Uh, the guy who played Eddie, which he's fucking. Didn't something happen to him? Yeah, he's doing crazy interviews now. God bless, God bless whatever is going on with him. But he, <laughs> I loved his. Uh, he was so funny. His comedic timing was great. So I really looked up to like the Disney era, and then once I started getting into like stand up comedy, like when Kevin Hart's podcast uh, 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 specials got put on Netflix, like Netflix changed the whole game with with stand up. So then I started watching a lot of stand up and I really, you know, like Nick Swartz and a lot of Adam Sandler movies I loved, like Happy Gilmore. I kind of got into that phase. So uh, what really made me move to L.A. was Sons of Anarchy. I watched Sons of Anarchy and I was Charlie Hunnam's so fucking cool. <laughs> and I'm like, God, like, I just want to do this. And that's really I think that was really the show that made me make the move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you go out to LA. Do you have resources? Do you have anything? Are you by yourself? What's that look like? So my uncle, he um, he was the only person I knew in LA, and he he created Bates Motel. Um, but he was just doing that, and he was trying to get the next thing. So like, I remember I was like, oh, is there like, do you have any? You think you have an agent or anything like that? And he's like, I'm trying to do it too. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I really, you know. Um, so I remember being like, ah, oh, damn, like I'm just out here. And no connections, no anything. I just, like, I think just moving away and playing hockey and figuring, going to different schools and figuring out, like, I just, I know people well. So when I 
would meet people or, or f- I just figured out the business so quick. And I, I actually got an agent within the first couple of weeks of me being here. That's but, pretty unheard of. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, I, I went on LA casting. I, you know, got a thing and an agent reached out to me and I remember just like, okay, now I got this. Now I got to get a commercial agent. Now I got to get a voiceover agent. And I would have no credits and all these people would go to my IMDB and you're like, well, how do you represent it by like 10 people? You don't have, and I just was able to figure out the business and I'm like, now I got to get really fucking good at acting because mm-hmm. now I know the business side. So then I would take like six or seven classes a week, like four hour classes, worked a restaurant job and just grind it and got as good as I possibly could be. Cause like once that opportunity comes knocking, which was that co-star on power, which turned into, you know, being a series regular, uh, you got to deliver cause you might, you know, you know, you don't get these opportunities a lot. So I booked a couple guest stars and then I did that movie Ma right before power. And that was kind of how everything like blew up. Yeah. Talk about that grind aspect of it because there's so many people that do do what you do and don't make it or are even scared to jump in and leave a job they don't like or move away and, and work that, you know, you know, restaurant job right. or driving Uber or doing what, what they have to do. What was that like for you? I didn't have anything else. Like I, like a lot of people have a backup plan and I think act, acting was technically my backup plan because hockey was always the plan, but really I wanted to do acting, but the backup plan was acting. So I'm like, this, this is it. This is all I have. If I don't d- give this my all, I like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. Like I didn't ever want to do anything else. So, but I n- never one time thought in my head that I wouldn't make it like, I didn't have a second of doubt. I, th- I know that's so crazy to say now because, you know, you do get in a little, like now you're in a pool with, okay, now you got to book these bigger movies. And then it gets to the, once you get to the top, it's harder and harder because all this stuff is being offered to all these A-listers already. And you just got to fucking beat them out. So a little, you know, doubt can be, ah, oh, well, they're not going to offer me that. But back then I had nothing. And I was like, I know I'm going to fucking make it. <laughs> I had no doubts in my mind. So Looking back, it is kind of crazy, but I'm here. and you No, know. I'm the same way. I dive right in. Like I remember when I, I was out four years before I got into social media, and one day I woke up. I was actually, funny story, I was MTV was about to cast me in a dating show. No, wait, right when you got out? No, so it was four years after HBO Doc came out. Didn't really like blow me up like because it was HBO Max. No one was watching that right. shit at the time. It was brand new. It wasn't Netflix, you know? And um, I got on TikTok, and my first viral video was talking about solitary. Mm-hmm. And then an MTV casting producer hit me up there like, we love you for this dating European show or whatever. I was like, great, this is fake because I just got my passport back from the feds. Right. I quit my job at Whole Foods. Nice. I had worked at Whole Foods for three, four years, but then the casting producer ghosted me. So I was stuck with nothing but living off my credit cards for a few months, driving Uber, made an OnlyFans for a little bit. I was just <laughs> Were you fucking on OnlyFans? No, I wasn't fucking, but I, I – dude, uh, feet pictures, you know, you yeah. got to do what you got to do, right, you know? Right, right. And, and it's not sustainable for a guy unless you are fucking – or, you know, because you can only do so much solo. Right, right. So I did that. Made I, I think I made like 10 grand in like two months doing that. Nice. Uh, but I mean, that's nothing compared to some of the women that right, do it. Right, right, right. And uh, then I finally, I got my first big break last year when No Jumper posted, um, I paid for protection, federal prison, uh-huh. one of my clips. And that kind of like exploded it. Right. But I, I feel you 100% on you just know you have that feeling no matter right. what. And right. that relates to people like that. They love that grind. When you got out, did they did they make you get a job at Whole Foods like immediately? So I got out and I had like three or four chapters of a book written in prison. I like read all the Wolf of Wall Street books, read every prison memoir. I'm like, this is going to be a movie. This is going to be a TV series. Right. I think I queried like 150 agents in LA and New York City. Out of all of them, four got back to me and then nothing ever ended up happening. Right. And it was just like, I kept doing things. I'd get like, you know, a little bit of a hook, like Vice did a documentary that did like 3 million hits on YouTube, but that didn't go anywhere. And then the HBO doc. And I was just so stuck on my story. And then when I realized that wasn't going to happen, I went to Whole Foods and they gave me a job for 15 bucks an hour at the hot bar. And I worked my way up until I was the manager. And I did that for three years while I was on probation and house arrest the first year with the ankle monitor. Um, so you did two years in and then you did a year with the Yeah, I did monitor. 24 months and they put me everywhere. I was in multiple prisons. I went on Con Air. Um, and, and it's interesting because when Power gets into like the Brooklyn Detention Center and MCC when Ghost gets arrested and whatnot, yeah. that's where I was. Right. Like what he lived through is what I lived through in that setting. And it's so like they, they hit it 
the nail on the head. Dude, you want to know what's so crazy? I, w- I want to keep asking you questions. We yeah, can do of this course. podcast for fucking four hours. <laughs> but um, so season two of, or season one of Ghost, mm-hmm. I remember it was um, episode six. It was when I was selling on the corner mm-hmm. uh, with uh, with Kane when he kidnaps me and my brother. <clears throat> um, there's a scene, I think it's at the end of that episode where um, – uh, Lorenzo throws him, uh, he goes to visit Lorenzo and he throws him against a glass in prison and the blood splatters everywhere. So, um, we, we shoot out of order. So I was shooting the scene afterwards where the cops pull, uh, it was, it was Monet's, uh, love interest that first season of, uh, Detective Ramirez, I think his name is. The one that got popped. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was the scene where he was pulling us over, um, and he was pulled Kane over and he sees me and Trace in the back seat. That scene was uh, con- like put together with a night shoot of in the prison. We shoot in l- real prisons. Wait, do so you guys go in the federal buildings or real no? prisons? I don't know. If, I don't know okay. what. I could check, but I don't know what prison it was exactly. I think it was Queens, but I could be. I could be wrong. Um, but there's inmates just walking around. Like so, lunch that day. So lunch is always like six hours after call. Mm. So if calls at five, lunch is at. 11 o'clock at night. They just call it lunch. Uh, so call, it was a night shoot. I think call was at five. And I, before we shot our scene, they broke for lunch. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to go, go to lunch. Lunch was in prison. Lunch was in the commissary in, in a real prison. So I go on the elevator and there's, I'm with a PA, uh, which is a production assistant. And there is also two inmates with a guard in the elevator and this was season one. Season one hadn't even aired yet, but they recognized me from the original power. And that didn't happen a lot because I was not on that show a lot. And the guys were like, oh, shit, it's Tariq's roommate from power. I'm like, dude, this is insane. Like, it's not even like we took a different – like, we were in the same elevators with two inmates with the, with a the, uh, 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 guard and me and a PA. And we were just all going up the elevator and like, oh, shit. And I'm like, these guys could fucking kill me right now. They That's incredible. To. Yeah, it's so fucking wild. I'm like, I, I want to write a movie about that so bad. About prison or – About – I, I, I have a great in. concept <laughs> about um, – People shooting movies in prison. Okay, I, I think there's something cool with that. That I I didn't know that they actually shot in the actual prison with inmates. Yeah. Like I know like Orange is the New Black. They got the abandoned one in New mm-hmm. York when they shot that. Right. Well, they they probably took that over for a while and made it a set. Yeah. We only would ever do like one or like when Tariq goes to prison, like one or two or three days. So to build a whole thing is tough because uh, you're not using it enough to build a whole set it might be cheaper to just rent it out for a day so that's what we did we shot at a live prison and it's yeah it was fucking crazy i remember being there like damn like they just shoot right in here i didn't even know yeah are there extra security precautions and whatnot or does the studio take care of all that for you guys? i mean we do have like security guards with us on set like stand outside our our um our trailers if we're because we shoot in like the trenches in new york like we're not <laughs> those you know, blocks that you see, we're not shooting in beautiful, we're shooting in the trenches at 2 a.m. And, you know, and that's what it is. Um, and it's so weird because we shot at the Weston townhouse, which was, um, uh, Upper East Side. And we, there's a house that they use a lot for the Weston townhouse is the house that they use. And the neighbors were fucking dickheads. Like these people have $50 million homes in the mm-hmm. Upper East Side. The neighbors would play loud music so we couldn't shoot, do fucked up shit to us. The rich people, like, would you have, if you live in this $50 million house, you're good. Go somewhere for a couple hours and just let the let us shoot. All these people have jobs. When we go to the trenches in the fucking hood, those motherfuckers are like, oh shit, it's power. Yeah, do your thing, do your thing. They're on the corners, these guys in the corners, we'll go to the next corner. It's it's so fucking mind boggling how like the rich people are like the assholes in the fifty million dollar walk ups and the people who are fucking on the corner on the street lot is like oh, oh be quiet so you guys can shoot yeah. it is oh it's always just fucking mind boggling me to see like how people move in the world especially like when we shoot in New York City I mean you guys every cast member in power represents people that have lived that like all of your stories I've seen firsthand played out with people I met in federal prison right. which is fascinating and that brings us to why power is so big in prison. Like, I remember my, I had this big jacked Asian bunk mate who was doing 10 years for Molly. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was in Fort Dix in New Jersey. And one day he's like, hey, Bunky. And they used to call me McLovin too, because I look like <laughs> McLovin. 
and uh, squints from the sandlot. That's fucking hilarious. So um, he was like, it was like at 4 a.m. and he taps me on the bunk after they did count. He's like, we got a good guard, come downstairs. And I'm thinking I'm going to get jumped or something. Yeah. What happens is I go downstairs, there's like 15 or 20 people that woke up at the crack of dawn on Saturday morning to insert a smuggled in SD card that they downloaded the power series off of a contraband phone with a boost mobile phone plan. And they are dedicated, die hard power listeners. I started it from season one. I would wake that got me through my sentence, bro. That's like insane. waking up early when there was a good guard, crack of dawn, watching those episodes because it's so addicting. Right. And then I called my dad. I'm like, Dad, you gotta watch power. And then he got put onto it. But all these inmates, they they love it. They they're obsessed with it. Did you guys know that there's this interest in prison like that? Yeah. It's funny because um obviously like when we go places, if I have a club hosting in like, you know, Cleveland or somewhere like that, I'll have dudes come up to me and be like, yo, I live that power life. Like I did, I did eight years. I watched him break. Like, we get that a lot. But the first time it ever happened was, um, before, uh, season one had even aired. I would met this, this, one of my friend's sisters was dating this guy who just got out. And he said like, it was the first and I had a conversation with him. He's like, oh, you're on power, dude. He's like, yeah, bro, we watched that. Like, even in California, because in New York, everyone watched it. Mm -hmm. California, you get some spots here and there. But he's like, yeah, up in, um, what's what's the California prison? Uh, San Quentin. Yeah, San, he's like, in, yeah, in Quentin, we uh, we watch power like crazy. We, can't, we heard there's a new show, like all this <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, I didn't know that they would be allowed to watch it, but you're right. Obviously, there was, it get was it smuggled, smuggled in. Yeah, because yeah. you don't have stars on, right. on the prison TV, <laughs> yeah, hopefully yeah, yeah. one day. Yeah. But it's also way more mainstream than it was five or six years right. ago. I think the last couple seasons really blew it up. Right. I'll say I'll say, Power, Ghost, and now Force are my favorite. L Raising Cane's a little slower. Right. Um, but now the last season, Fire. Yeah. Do you know, you saw that, well, who I tagged you in, Unique? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that's actually based off of him? Uh, you, it, so he's I don't, like this uh, yeah, I, yeah, guy. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so mm -hmm. because um, they do like the guy Sasha Penn who write like they do all their own storytelling and writing. Maybe they look for some inspiration, but I don't think they ever. There's a lot of people who come out and say this is based <laughs> on me or this is this or this is that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that's the case. But I also didn't watch that podcast, and I don't know who he is, so I can't speak on it. Yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, I, may, I don't think so. So when you got cast in Power, that wasn't like a big role right away. That that it kind of grew into that. So what were you doing yeah. in between? I, I did a lot of voiceover stuff. That's how I paid the bills. I, I was once I did that movie Ma. Um, I was able to not have to work at a restaurant anymore, and then I got into like doing voiceover stuff. I did a lot of spots for Abercrombie. So I was like being able to pay the bills. Um, and then I did that first episode of Power, which I almost didn't even do the tape. My mom loved the show. And I was so poor in LA, like I didn't have stars. Yeah. I didn't even have Netflix. Like I was sleeping on a popped air mattress. And I remember my mom was like, watch the, uh, do that tape. Like me and your husband, uh, me and your dad uh, uh, love that show. And I was like, oh, all right, I'll just do the tape. Because I was going to shoot that movie, Ma, anyways, and it was right before, and I was like, eh, I want to focus on the movie. Um, thank God I did that tape. But um, it then it turned into a recurring season six, which means multiple episodes, but not a series regular or lead. And then Ghost, obviously, was like a straight offer for to be one of the leads of that show, which is, you know, been the last four years of my life, and it's been fucking amazing. How far in advance did you know that Ghost was going to happen? Um, so there was... There was a moment in season six when 50 was directing. It was episode 602 or 603. I don't remember. Um, but 50, it was me, Mike. This is when I first started getting real close with Michael, who plays Tariq. And 50 came up to us and he he just goes, oh, yeah, you guys take over and, like, walked away. <laughs> and, like, I'm an actor with, like, $1,500 in my bank account. I'm like – well, what do you mean by we take over? Like, so in my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be on the rest of the episodes of season six. Great. I'm going to be fucking in every episode. It's going to be awesome. And we shoot 603 and I don't hear for months, 604, five, six. I see them filming. And then I see stars picks up five more episodes for, um, to close out power because they were, they did a 15 episode season six. And I was like, oh, great. I'm going to be in those last five episodes. It's going to be fucking fire. <laughs> No call, no anything. So I'm like, 
damn, 50 fucking lied to me. 50 cent lied to my face. Like, that's fucking crazy. And around the time that that was all happening, that movie that I shot was just about to come out. Theatrical release, Universal Pictures. It's be fucking massive. I'm like, okay, I got, I got this. Fuck power. <laughs> A week so, so the way that Blumhouse works is that they give you scale, which is like, you know, $2,500 a week. I only made like $8,000 on that movie, Ma. But they give you back end. My team fucked up my contract to where I didn't, I didn't get back end until like $50 million box office, which is we were going up against Godzilla and we we're going up against Rocket Man that weekend. That's when... It was like a weekend of like four movies are coming out. What are you going to go see? So I'm like, motherfucker, this has to hit 50 million or I'm working in a in a restaurant. Like I'm back. I just was in a movie that is going to be in theaters. Then I'm going back to a restaurant because I'm like 15K in debt now. I'm like holding on to this movie. So a week before the movie releases, it was like May 20 something. Um, I get. Uh, a DM, for, it's crazy, a DM, because I had fired my whole team because mm -hmm. they fucked up my contract. So I didn't have any contacts on my IMDb at the time. And Courtney Kemp, the showrunner, DMs me, and she's like, um, hey, you're um, you're in the spinoff, you're in the spinoff with uh, with Tariq, it's it's you guys. Uh, who's your man, who's your team now? So I like reached whatever, I set everything up, and I was like, <laughs> No fucking way. So then we got on a phone, you know, 50, and he's like, yeah, you guys are the leads in the new spinoff. And I was like, oh, I don't even care how this fucking movie does. Like, thank God. So That's I knew incredible. it was, it, I knew it was happening. Um, and then we shot it in like October. So I knew like four months in advance. The movie came out, Ma, and it did $47 million. It didn't hit 50. Three million shy. Didn't make any back end on that movie. I paid $10,000 for a publicist. I lost Three grand on that movie. Wait, so you have to hit it the first weekend to get Not back the end? first weekend. It just has to hit domestic. Like, it could be three, four weekends. But the first weekend is, like, the biggest weekend. Mm -hmm. So you – and I was looking. I was like, oh, I think it did, like, $27 million the first weekend. I was like, <laughs> I was like, if we keep this up, I can get there. And it hit, it hit 47, and I – yeah, I didn't – It's I like didn't. me looking at the YouTube numbers every morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> fuck. But yeah, it was a, it's a crazy fucking business, dude. Like, people think, oh, you started a movie, you're fucking rich. I'm like, no, nah, I lost money on that fucking movie. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, that was a crazy time. But that's kind of when Power All came together. And yeah, I haven't looked back since. It's been fucking great. That kind of, I, I think season one of, of Ghost definitely exploded you into more of a mainstream media. Like, For sure. I, I see you popping up everywhere on Instagram, yeah. on social media. Like, I feel like the bigger, like, female influencers, you're coming on their radar. I was just reading that article about, how do you pronounce her name? Koi? Oh, Koi Lorette. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was actually a thing. No. So <laughs> I, uh, TMZ stopped me one day and they do this thing like, shoot your shot. And dude, it's so weird. I like see a girl for like a couple weeks on Instagram and I'm like, oh, she looks so good. Like I'd, I'd run away with this girl. So for some reason, those couple weeks, I was like on a Koi Lorray kick. I was like, God, she, like, and she's beautiful. I love her. Like she's great. Her music's great. Um, and TMZ stopped me and they're like, do your shoot your shot. And I like panicked. I was like, I don't have anyone. But like, I know sometimes how to get a reaction. And I was like, Fucking Coil Ray, what's up? <laughs> and it just went crazy viral because she's friends with Michael and I DM'd her and she just like left me on red one day. And I was like, damn, that's crazy. She really left me on red. I, I shot my shot with her, not even on TMZ. That was like a couple weeks before that. Yeah. Cause me and Michael were on set and he's like, oh, Coy just responded to my story. And I was like, oh, tell her I said, what's up? And I was like sending her voice messages. And then I DM'd her on my own Instagram, no answer. And I was like, damn, she left me on red. So I said that on TMZ, like to be funny. Not knowing that fucking complex and hip hop, hot new hip hop, all this shit picked it up, and I'm like a fucking chorus. But like, I, I I don't I don't have a thing where I'm like, oh, I need to be the fucking cool guy that like gets all the girls. Like, I don't fucking care. I want to. I like being funny more. I re I like being funny more than being the cool guy. So if it makes me look dumb that I shot my shot with Coil Ray and she didn't answer, okay. Like, mm. it's not the end of the world. It's funny. Do you have to be cautious in like today's world sliding into someone's DMs because they can just easily screenshot it and post it or is it no fucks given? Me, I kind of go no fucks given. I'm more <laughs> of like a shoot your shot kind of guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess I feel like I feel like because we're on power, we get a little bit of leeway 
it, they treat us like rappers. Like we're the only television show, maybe a couple of 50s other shows, but BMF who really cares about those guys. You've been um, posting about BMF all week. These man. motherfuckers. <laughs> um, but we're the only, like, we get to go do club hostings. There's no other actors on any shows in the world. No one on fucking, I don't care how big Jenna Ortega is with her 30 million followers that just happened from Wednesday. Her fans aren't going to a club hosting for her. You know what I mean? Like, that's not the the angle that the, we get to go to club hostings and like 50 plays and 50 brings us out on stage and like, oh, so we get treated like rappers. So I feel like we get a little bit of leeway of like, okay, slide the DMs are like, I hang out with some of the mainstream Hollywood kids and they think I'm fucking crazy. They're like, the stuff that you do, I would never do. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I get it because they're under more of a Hollywood microscope and I eventually will be. But right now I'm like, oh, I get to kind of have a little fun because I'm on power and we get we get away with a little bit more than than most people. Yeah, on, I didn't even think of it in that aspect because that, that's like the era I grew up around where you, you pay the guy to come host the club. Like instead of booking a whole set with like a famous rap star – you you have them do an appearance, which I'm sure 50 probably does a lot of those. You get a flat rate. You come a couple songs, and then they bring you and, and Michael out there. Right. I, I watched the clips of you guys on stage. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. And your your regular actor or actress is not doing that. At all. I, I mean, there's no other actors that, like, 50 Cent is bringing out unless it's, you know, someone on power. So I I, I really try to, um, to go see him a lot when he's on tour. And— you know, he'll he'll go to Prague, he'll go to London, he'll go to, to Europe, and I'll fly to Europe. Because I also get to have, like, some good quality time with 50 because he's so busy. Except when he's on tour and, like, if he's in Czech Republic, he's in Czech Republic. Uh, it, there's nothing – he's on tour with who he's on tour with. And no one's coming to visit him out there. Everyone goes to the L.A. shows. Everyone goes to New York shows. Mm. No one goes to the those shows. So I make it a point to go to those shows because I'm like, oh, I'll get to sp- spend four or five hours with 50 in his dressing room and just chop it up get to see a legend perform. It it never gets old, like seeing him. And then he'll bring me out. Yeah, fucking any, anytime you go in, I'll come with you. If you want me there, I'll come with you, 50. So I've gone to a ton of shows overseas, and I think those are the best shows to go to because the New York and L.A. shows, motherfuckers are leaving early. <laughs> like, 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 they're seeing a legend, and sometimes they're like, oh, yeah, like, unreal. We saw the songs we want to see. And sometimes I'll see a couple people leave. You will never see one person leave in one of those countries because they don't get to ever see celebrities. So, like, they see them on stage. They're like, oh, my God. They are so drawn to it as opposed to, like, people in L.A. and New York. They're like, oh, fuck yeah. Like, and then they just leave. I'm like, these are, you got to go to those shows. How do you stay away from, like, drugs and excessive alcohol in the entertainment business? Being so young and so energetic and, you know, there's I'm sure there's a lot of influences. Yeah, I just... I was never a drug or alcohol guy because of of hockey. And I always felt like that was my edge. That like, even though, you know, I'm smaller than everyone else, uh, you know, all these hockey players are fucking 6'5 in the NHL. I was like, I am I work harder than everyone else and uh, I, I take it seriously. So that was kind of always my thing in my head. Like, I'm, I'm going to, f- God's going to fucking put me in the, in the good position because I take it seriously. Then when I moved to LA, I kind of just had that same mentality. Also, I was poor. Like, how the fuck am I paying for any alcohol or drug? Like, I could barely pay for acting class. Mm. So then once I kind of, you know, got, started getting more success and getting more money, like, I just got more hungry and just, like, locked the fuck in. So I, I think I drink maybe, like, once, once every couple months. If I'll do a club hosting, now I'll drink a little bit just to feel good, like not to get fucked up because also you're in some dangerous situations. You want to like, you know, be aware, but sometimes it's hard being at a club at 3am in Miami being dead sober. So I'll drink a little bit or whatever, but yeah, I'm not really a drug guy. I don't, I don't love it. You know, that's good. Stay that way. (laughs) I know. I like fucking being in control. I don't, I don't like not, you know, being able to Especially being in some of those situations you're in, you're like, fuck, like, if yeah. something pops off, I gotta, No, you know? anything could happen in a flash, and then you kind of lose everything. Yeah. Did you do any in prison, or did Drugs? You, yeah. Did you no, any? I was never a drug guy. Um, even when I owned the club, I wasn't really a drinker, because I was under federal indictment the whole time, so I couldn't drink, I couldn't smoke. Yeah. Um, I couldn't do anything. I mean, I, I would smoke weed, I'd do edibles now. Uh, I do the Tyson edibles. Those nice. things are the best. Nice. Um, the ears? Yeah, the yeah. ears. There's, there's an ear on this. Oh, nice. Yeah, I got to, I, I met him um, a couple months ago in the city um and that's how i got the merch and stuff yeah, he's and a he, man he's so cool yeah. he looks at me he's like 
you look like a smart motherfucker. And then he took a hit of his joy. <laughs> yeah, I went to go see him train for, um, I think it was a Holyfield fight. And he like came up to me and he was like, tell 50 I want to be on power. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll let him know, Mike. He's like, yeah, tell 50 I want to be on power. I was like, all right, I will. You know, I could totally see you getting into like celebrity boxing or something like that. See, here's the thing. I... As much as I don't take myself seriously because I fucking hate actors that smell their own farts. They're like, oh, everything I do is fucking so serious. Like, dude, you're putting on a fucking costume and you're acting. Like, have fun. Don't take yourself so f- You're not curing cancer. Sure, like, there are... We are saving in some way, like people, like people in prison. They fuck it, like they're like, this is all I have right now. Like I get that aspect of it. Same thing with music, but like some of these actors take themselves so fucking seriously. Boxing is where I draw the line because <laughs> I have such a respect for combat sports that I feel like a lot of that has turned into kind of a joke, and I I don't like I don't ever want to look like just an idiot for a paycheck. I'm like I. Do what I do for a reason. I love doing it. I don't want to, dude, I don't want to get fucking punched in the head. I got enough concussions playing hockey. I don't want to get hit in the head. I don't want to fight. I don't, I don't need it. No, you got to stick to what you're good at. Yeah. What, what your passion yeah. is, what drives you. Everyone has their own purpose in life. Yeah. Their own mission. And some take longer to find it than others. And, right. you know, me and you are both lucky that we found kind of our direction and passions. I only had to go through federal prison to right. figure that out. Right. Um, but it's interesting in that respect. Now, we have a lot of, like, parents that watch the show, mm-hmm. parents whose sons or daughters went to prison, um, who would also could say that maybe a show like Power influences criminal behavior. Yeah. How do you feel about that? And what kind of um, – role does that take on when you play a character like that and you have to do those types of things? See, I I see both sides of it. I see how it could. Um, but look, I think if you're you're already going to do it. Like no one I don't, I just don't think everyone's going to watch and be like, "Yeah, I think I want to commit a felony now." I think if it's in you, it's in you, you know, and you're going to and you're going to fucking do it. Sure it might speed the process up a little bit, but I don't know. I, I see. I see how it could be that with music and stuff like that, um, but I don't know. I just think if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. And, you know, no. Mm-hmm. And if someone, you got to be smart enough to like know that that's entertainment. Like a lot of these these guys, in these raps, like they're not doing a lot of this shit. Some of them are, but you got to be smart enough to like you're gonna base your life choices something that could literally put you in jail on a television show or on a little baby track like you got you got to be smart enough to differentiate in my opinion yeah no i agree it's like growing up everyone was giving grand theft auto a hard time right they were blaming that on the things that were happening in the world and i i don't think that's what that's the a cause crazy of crazy thing that you're yeah it's like it, tommy versetti you got that <laughs> you're shooting you're like come on this oh, isn't me. that was the other thing you know who was at the studio last week who um, Dominic Lombardi. I love him. Yeah, Lombardozzi. Yeah, he yeah. said he never got to work with you. Yeah. Um, but we were talking because he was on my coach's um, show because nice. they train. He does boxing. Yep. yep. So he trains. Yeah, with we him. follow each other. Yeah, I got to have him come on the pod too. Dude, but. I love him. I I know him from Entourage. Like, uh, have you seen Entourage? I haven't. I got dude. To, dude, I just finished Sopranos or almost finished oh, it, shit. and this is like years yeah. later. I'm behind. Your next show, you got to watch Entourage. It's so good. I actually, become good friends with Jerry for our. I saw played. your yeah. text yesterday. Yeah, he yeah. was on um on. Entourage before, and then he uh, was Proctor. On, Proctor is yeah. the goat, man. Go, great. They did him dirty the way he went out. <laughs> I, know, but I know. I wish he was still around, but Method Man's killing it too. Yeah, yeah, and that's the best. I love him. My friend saw him at a uh, Jets game. Isn't he? The, dude, yeah. he's literally the nicest guy. Yeah, he's. My friend went up to him because he's good friends with me. He's like, "Yo, I want you to come on this podcast." He's like, "I'm not doing podcasts right now." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he came and did mine and Michael's podcast. The crew has it on a holiday. It on a Sunday. It was a holiday, and on Monday he was shooting at like 6 a.m. He pulled up. Wow. Whatever you guys need, I'm there. One of the fucking most stand-up, nicest guys ever, and you would never believe it. He's a fucking Wu-Tang Clan. Yeah, so your podcast, that that blew up pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. When I, I saw it from when you guys launched it yeah. to where it is now, that's probably one of the fastest-growing podcasts in the world yeah. on that sense, and you guys weren't even like at the top of your your peak yet yeah. when that happened. What's that like for you with the podcast? I love doing it. I, I mean, me and Mike just have such a good time. Um, and then we just, you know, you get to talk to people and meet people that you would have never had that conversation with. And I just think it's a great tool as a human being, you know, as a as an artist, as an actor. Um, 
And it just, yeah, it just to do something different. I, I think the days of the movie star, like back in the day, it was people want to see you on screen and you got to be mysterious. Where now it's totally switched. There's no more day of the movie star anymore. Like maybe Timothy Chalamet is like the fucking last one. But it's, are do you have a huge following on social media? Do you have a, a pot? You know, are, are you diversifying? You're not just making money on acting anymore because a lot of that shit is, has, you know, gone away. You know, they're doing less shows now. You know, the, the TV boom has already happened. So it's becoming a little bit more of a niche. So you got to diversify and have a bunch of different things. And I saw that coming a mile away. So I was like, yeah, I'm just going to make sure I have, you know, everything going. And I'm not like a serious fucking actor guy. Like, sure, I'll, I can do serious shit and really, really well. Um, but I just, I want to do everything. I want to be the guy that's interviewing someone on a red carpet. And the next year I want to be on that carpet with a movie that's, you know, winning an award. Like mm-hmm. I, I just want to be a Swiss army knife in the industry and just be, have fun. Like that's why I'm here to have fucking fun. Yeah. I'm not here to like sniff my own farts and be like, oh, what I, dude, when I prepare for a role, it's like, dude, what are we talking about? Are you guys going to expand outside of cast members? Yeah, that's the plan. I mean, we, ju- we just started doing it before, um, before this, you know, we were doing it a little bit during the strike, but Michael, he's in New York, I'm in LA. We kind of have a, a plan that we're gonna go with when, you know, when Ghost comes back. Um, but we're, we, we wanna start expanding outside of the power universe. We did a little bit with Powell Benchero, Keith Lee, you know, uh, food reviewer on uh, TikTok. We have a lot of different people that we wanna interview. So we're just starting to like, you know, breach that a little bit. And I'm, I'm excited. Uh, but we just kind of, it's hard because he lives in New York and I'm in LA and we don't do it all on our own because we're doing so much other shit that is hard. Like I can't fucking edit all day long and, <laughs> and I'm doing the clips and I'm doing that. Like when we do it, it, it's expensive when we make a podcast. So it's tough to like make a good profit and be like, Oh, do we really want to show up to the fucking studio today? But, um, we, we got a plan coming up to, to go with the new partner. So we're excited. Do you guys have your own studio and whatnot? We did. We no longer work with that company anymore. Oh, it's a different, you yeah. guys were with a company when you launched yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It looked, it looked cool though. The yeah. studio and yeah. the name's cool. The crew has it, yep. but I just saw your YouTube just like pop. crazy. Yeah. yeah. That was super exciting. Yeah. What's something that you want people to, to know about you that they might not know about you? Like maybe about your personality or your characteristics that it's not really portrayed on TV or on social media. That is a good question. I don't know. I feel like I'm pretty transparent. Like if you follow me, I'm I, I I'm me. I'm just fucking me. Like I I don't try and put on a front for anyone. Like I, I, sometimes I do post crazy shit on social media. Not crazy, but like I'm I'm me. Like I'll be like, oh, this fucking idiot said this to me today, and people are like you know you're a celebrity. You. you sh- can't be you can't be doing that. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. And sometimes I'll see producers that I've worked with and they'll see me post crazy shit and I'll see them view it and I'll go, oh fuck. Like, but I think that's just what you know makes me me. And I'm just gonna be me. I'm not gonna try and put on a front for any producer or director that follows me to look like a nice guy or this or that. I always think those those undercover nice guys are always the worst people mm. because they have to put on this front and then they're just low-key dirtbags. I'm like, nah, I'm just gonna be me and have fun. And that's why I do this. I don't do this for any other reason other than I like nice things and I like having fun. And you know what? You're a hustler and you're a good yeah. dude. I mean, I've interviewed celebrities and, and stuff like that and they show up with posse sometimes. Yeah. You came by yourself. Came dolo. You were like, yo, yeah. hit me up. Here yeah. we go. Let's do this. Like yeah. that, that's, you got to respect that yeah. about someone. You don't let it get to your head and yeah. you're just a hardworking, like you grinded, like Photos on social media, you could post the flashy cars, this and that. People right. don't see behind the scenes of what it took to get there. Right, for sure. It's not just handed to you. Yeah, for sure. I work my fucking ass off. Like I, a lot of times, I was in acting class, and I'd have teachers say to me, "You're you're you're burning yourself out. You're working too hard." And I remember being like, "Nope, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> get there, no matter what it takes." And I think that's that. Like, if anyone could take away anything from this, you know, this episode is that. If you just grind and have an un and, and it's hard because grind is such a broad term. Like like if you're doing something like what is what am I what is grind to that profession? If you just do everything you possibly can every second and and just have an unwavering faith in yourself that you're gonna make it happen, you're gonna do it regardless of anything. Any outside, you know, voice or anything, if you just know you're gonna be where you say you're going to be, you're going to do it. Like there's, there's no, there's no way it doesn't happen. 
I respect that, man. Gianni, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Looking forward to dinner tonight. For with, sure. Uh, with, so, with so, you know, we, we got it. <laughs> I want to do another episode on you. So right before a ghost comes out, if you're if you're in uh, in L.A., we'll, we'll get another episode. Dude, in. I'm going to be coming here once a month oh, pretty much. Yeah, I'm bet. using this. So we'll, we'll do another one yeah, for sure. Yeah, if you want to do I mean, pick my brain whenever. We'll exchange numbers and shit too. Get oh, off yeah. TikTok. Oh, but, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, dude, it's a pleasure, man. I'm, I'm glad we finally got to meet and, and you know, uh, for a relationship and uh, keep in touch and yeah. we'll definitely uh, keep shooting some content together. And for stuff. sure, for sure. I, dude, I love your fucking story. I really <laughs> do. So hopefully I'll play you in a movie one day. But yeah, we'll, we'll do another episode. We'll get into some deeper stuff uh, with you. Cool. Sounds good, man. Thank you for having me.